Is she amazing or what? Come on, give God honor for Pastor Samson. She's like, we were up at four in the morning. <laughs> you can't tell, can you? <laughs> That's so awesome. Oh my goodness. You know what's sweet about Teresa's testimony is that she did come up for a mother. Some of you weren't here and you know, God will show you things and you'll hear things for people like she wants to pray for her mother and the Lord, she didn't tell me about the pain. She didn't tell me that this dark cloud, yeah. I just saw it. Yeah. And I said, what do you got going in your, what? And I, I told, and I said about moving and shifting at night. And some of you were here. Yeah. And I said, and, I, and this thing, I said, look at me. That thing that's suppressing you, that dark, I see it. Look at it. She went home and it's gone. And she told me she slept all night. But, but see, it's beautiful. You know, some of us struggle and we'll say, oh, I want God to use me like that. And, oh, I wish I could hear like that. And, oh, I need the prophetic. And, oh, I need the word of knowledge. I'm telling you, if we get alone with God and let him make our heart one with him, and our motivation is always and only ever love, God can tell himself anything. So if your heart becomes one with him, he can let you in on anything because you'll handle the information like God handles the information. See, he's not a newspaper editor. He's not a gossip. He's not an information giver. He loves people. So you'll be amazed that I'm out and about. I'm in the highways and byways. And he just tells me stuff about people. And I'm like, hey, excuse me. And they're like, oh, my God. How do you? People go, are you psychic? Well, no. Well, kind of, but no. <laughs> It's so fun, and, but it's nothing you ever strive for. It's nothing you, sometimes we think, boy, if God could just use me like that, I'd feel so qualified. No, you are qualified, and because you're qualified, God will use you like that. You, you have to start in your being, not your doing. You're a human being, not a human doing. You have to be. You have to be righteous, be loved, be accepted, be forgiven, be God's choice from the beginning of time. No matter how much you messed up your life, you didn't know who you were, but God knew who you were. And He sent His Son to get that lie off of you and get that truth inside of you. Man, think about it. Come on, guys. I've been preaching it all weekend, you know. He loves us so much. He knows who He made us to be. We were born in identity crisis. When man ate the tree in the garden of the tree, he lost sight of who he was. He, he got out of touch with God. When God came, he ran and hid. Tried to cover his sin, guilty and ashamed. That's what sin does. It perverts everything. God's still a father. God's still good. And God still loves. And man's running from one so lovely. Why? Because sin and guilt and shame and condemnation. But here's God, Adam... Where are you? Yeah. Come on, he knew where he was. Yeah. He was the God that some of us grew up with. He just smote him from heaven. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. But here he is looking to prophesy and bring forth promise and hope and covenant. Mm -hmm. God is amazing. Yeah. Adam's under the bushes and trees. <laughs> I don't know what Eve was doing, you know, but she was hiding too. Yeah. But I know what Adam was doing. <laughs> fig leaves your own sin and trying to cover your own it's your effort and your attempt to hide behind your own shame yeah. it's useless it's vanity and it changes nothing yeah. denial one of the biggest deceptions just shame just hiding in the shadows no you let God love you yeah. You say, look, what I did, I know I shouldn't have done. I'm more than that. You made me more than that. That thing is not who I am, God. And thank you for washing me and cleansing me and forgiving me and setting me free. Yeah. Man, you've got to not just make peace with God, but peace in your own heart. Yeah. So you can look in the mirror and see what God has always seen. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a big deal. I look in the mirror and I smile, man. It's on. I'm like... I'm like, I'll brush my teeth, my hair could be bent from the night. You know what I mean? I'm like, dude, you're amazing. <laughs> Whoa, I see God in you, sir. <laughs> I'm serious. I ain't playing. I love your hat. Your hat's cool. <laughs> I look in that mirror. I've done this. I walk by the full-length mirror. Serious. It ain't vanity. It's faith. It's truth. It's... Yeah. I walk by the full length mirror and go, what? Are you kidding me? Sir, you're filled with God. I see the grace and favor of God all over you, sir. I get right here. 
look right dead straight in my eyeball. See, a lot of people can't do that. Because when they look in the eyes, they see the things they've done. They see the things that people have said and haven't said. And they let life define them instead of the gospel. And when they look in their eyes, they go, ugh. Instead of, whoa. It's a big deal. Find a mirror. mirror. Find it quick. Because you ought to see what I see. (laughs) Yeah, you might want to slip out of the ladies' room. (laughs) You might want to just take a peek. At what I'm looking at, girl. And you might want to just go, you go, God. You have your way. (laughs) I'm serious. I ain't playing. I'm too much of a man of God to hype you. You were predestined before the foundation of the world. Before you were ever born, God knew you. Ecclesiastes says there's a time to be born. And here you sit in the chair. You're not happenstance. I don't care how many mistakes you made, how much you messed up. God has known who you are. From the beginning of time. And he sent his son to pull you out of the lie. And put you in truth. Yeah you ought to find a mirror. (laughs) I look at that full full length mirror. And I I get right in my eyeballs. Sir I see the favor and spirit of God in you. I see righteousness all over you. Sir you're filled with the Holy Spirit. What are you doing standing here? Somebody needs what I see in you. Why don't you go multiply? Why don't you go shine the light of love? I see you consumed with love. Go have an amazing day, sir. (laughs) You get it? Whoa. (laughs) Did I get your hair standing up? (laughs) Come on. That sure beats believing the lie. That sure believes, you know, what happened to me when I was four, eating my lunch when I'm 40. Come on, I'm being straight with you. Well, you don't know what it was like when I was growing up. And you're 40. Well, you're 40. Let truth come and ravage your heart and change you and stop being a product of something you're not. Our flesh doesn't need any more justification and excuses. Let's stop saying yell but, let's say yay God. Come on, it's been tough. All of us have a story. Every one of us in this room have a story. Every one of us have unfortunate happenings and trauma. What good would it do to sit and hash our war stories to see who's been through the most hell now that heaven has come to the earth? Man has been blind and deceived and the people in your life, if they knew who they were and knew who God was, they wouldn't have done what they did or said what they said. And why are we still letting that define who we are now that Christ has come? Come on. Straight with you now. I'm not being insensitive. I'm being love. Love tells the truth. For your sake. Because I'm leaving town. I don't have a need to correct you. I don't have a need to adjust you and set you straight and be right in your life. I didn't have a need to come here. I wanted to come here. And you were gracious enough to ask me. And I'm glad I did because I got to see your face. And you bless me every time I look at you. (laughs) You are so lovable. It's ridiculous. Steve, she's she's awesome. I turned and said, oh, me, Pastor Sandra. I said, she went, hi, brother. I said, Whoa. (laughs) Keep it shining, girl. Come on, this thing is real. I've pastored for years. I've counseled people. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done. Why is that the issue? What he has done is the issue. Come on, he already knew what you did and what you were going to do. And why you were yet a sinner, he sent the Son. Let's get over this thing. Let's realize that, look, he made us in his image. And no matter where we've been and what we've done and how bad sin ravaged us, he never lost sight of who we are in him. And love is simple in that light. In other words, you can't change your eternal value. You can't change your created value. You can't change who God made you to be. I don't care how much you sin, how much you miss the mark, and how much you run. God knows who you're created to be. And He's never lost sight of that. So He paid the price to redeem that truth and get the sin off of you. Now you can choose to keep on believing lies and sin and let the world define you and let people define you and let the acts of man and the words of man be greater than the act and word of God. That would be your privilege. But I would say don't do it. Why would you rob yourself blind? And run off into a destiny that was never yours. An identity that God never gave you. An identity that only sin produced. The fall of man. The day you eat the tree is the day you surely die, Adam. He didn't fall over dead. He died spiritually. He lost his identity. He lost his connection and communion with God. His connection with love was cut off. 
And what was created in God's image, which is love. God's image is love, church. God is love. So he made man to love. So man eats the tree, gets cut off from love, and becomes in desperate need of love. And every man was born into that place. And we all grew up in desperate need of identity, of love, of acceptance. We were all in the rat race of survival. And the truth underlying is we were all created for God's image. And this precious blood of Jesus is calling us home. This precious gift of God called Jesus Christ is telling us who we really are. And he says, now you deny yourself. You pick up your cross. Don't let the world rule you. Suffer through injustice. Press through everything that's not fair. And you follow me in perfect love. The first thing a Christian does is deny himself. Not pray a prayer to go to heaven. I've been preaching it all week. We've made it a prayer to go to heaven. It's not a prayer to go to heaven. It's heaven coming back inside of you. The goal of the gospel is not to get your name in a book called eternal life. The goal of the gospel is to get the nature of God back inside of you so you can reproduce life. And so you can manifest Christ. The gospel is not fulfilled until a man's nature is changed back to the image of God. (laughs) That's the glory of the inheritance in the saints. When you invest the blood of Jesus, your dividends and interest... His people reproduced after that seed and after his own kind. The glory of his inheritance in the saints. It's the hope of his calling. The glory of his inheritance in the saints. He receives an amazing kickback when he gives one son and obtains many sons. When he gives one heart of love and it springs up out of the earth and produces many hearts of love. We've turned it into an insurance policy, a passport to heaven someday. We've turned it into full vats and full barns and God just fixing what I broke. It is way deeper and way more powerful than God just taking care of your stuff. It's God getting inside of you and changing you from the inside out. Because if you clean the inside of the cup, the outside shall be clean. We do so much work on the outside. Just get ravaged in your heart and you'll be free. (laughs) We're trying to bear good fruit. (sighs) You imagine driving by an apple orchard. (sighs) Apples. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And then you worry if it's red enough. You worry if it's ripe enough. You worry if people will like it. Once you finally bear a little fruit, then you introspect it and critique it so much that it's half rotten until you're done. (laughs) You're not called. You're called to bear good fruit, but that's not your priority focus. You're called to be a good tree. See, it's not about the fruit. It's about the tree. He says a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. And you know a tree by its fruit. So what do we do? In a very shallow way, we look at that and go, Oh, we better bear good fruit, brother, so people see we're a good tree. No, no, no. Be a good tree. And your fruit's automatic. You're not struggling to bear fruit. You're enjoying being a good tree. What's that mean, Dan? It means I'm a son. I don't wake up and try not to sin. I don't wake up and try to live the Christian life. I wake up in love with God, in fellowship with God, and thank Him that He's loved me unfailingly. He's paid the price to get the lie off of me. He's made me a son in righteousness. There's no stain. There's no guilt. There's no shame. I'm free. You have passion towards me. You died for me. And I'm living in you. Yay for you, God. That's the Christian life. Yeah, man, I feel born again. I think I got saved this weekend. Ah, yeah. Let's get baptized, girl. Let's run to the river. <laughs> you know what that baptism's all about, isn't it? Old things passing away. I said we gotta build one at our church. This is my vision. Build this big commode. It's a vision of mine. I got it. We're going to do it. We're going to build this big commode. We're just not sure because it's going to take a lot of water to pull this off. But oh, you put them in there. And you pull them out and you hit the handle. Yeah. Yeah. And there ain't no looking back. There's nothing back there. It ain't how bad you failed. It ain't what you did yesterday. It's what you believe today and who Christ is inside of you that'll change your life forever. 
It's not about guilt, condemnation, and shame, and I feel so bad. That changes nothing. It just crushes you. There's a moment for godly sorrow, but there's a place to let Him love you and wash you and say you're changed. See, if you keep holding on to the lie, you'll think you're the lie, and you'll keep producing the lie. But if you ever step up and dare believe you become a son or a daughter, you dare believe God's love and His blood is sufficient for you, that He has washed you and forgiven you of everything you've ever done, and you wake up righteous, not trying not to sin, you wake up a son, you wake up a daughter, and you say, thank you for loving me. You will walk in a righteous consciousness, and it will produce His fruit to holiness. Why? Because you made a tree good. And what you behold, you become. You look into your past, you'll remain your past. And tomorrow will be yesterday. Yeah. You get that? Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You know what I really feel right now? The love of God. Whoo. I believe God before I feel God, but I'm a very touchy, tangible guy right now. <laughs> He loves me, yeah. and I'm cool with that. Yeah. Amen. We, we, we've, we've taught this false humility. Well, why would he love me? Because he created me in his image. Yes. Come on. Yeah, but you're just a person, and you're just a sinner. No, he didn't write to the sinners of Ephesus, the sinners of Philippi, the sinners of Colossae. He wrote to the saints. The blood is enough to make you clean if you believe it. You're not supposed to be sin conscious. And don't you let nobody sell you cheap. Because when they tell you, well, you're just a sinner, then you'll define your tree a wrong way and you'll produce fruit according to what you believe about you. Yes. Look, I'm not struggling with sin. I'm not fighting some war with sin. Yeah. Well, you say, yeah, but your war, your spirit, flesh, and just fighting each other. No, they are contrary to each other. It doesn't mean I'm subdued by a war. It says I live by my spirit yeah. and I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. I live out of my spirit. I live by truth and grace. I live by the grace of God. I am not damned to sin. I am not subject on eggshells today waiting for the next time I need to plead the blood. But along the way, if, if, not when, the Bible says if, you bump into something called sin, you quickly what? Well, first it says you have an advocate, Jesus the righteous, but you quickly, God, that is so not who I am. God, that is a lie that came through the fall. Thank you for the light in my life that now exposes the thing I used to call normal. God, I thank you. You're maturing me and growing me. My heart cares about I wish you didn't even care about. God, you are changing me into your image. Thank you for washing me in the blood and making me wiser, sharper, smarter, and stronger in you. Yay for you. You say, you do that if you'd miss it? I don't know anything else. What, do you drag your lip, cry, boo-hoo, and throw away grace? What, do you tell four friends and wear the identity and cloak and garment of sin and stain? Or do you rise up because your heart's already caring, you're already crying, you're already defiled inside, your conscience is already bothered. That means you've been changed by the truth of the gospel and you're purer than you think. Yes. You ought to rise up and say, thank you for putting light in me that exposes these things because it's not who I am. And you step out of darkness into the light, into the kingdom of the Son of His love. You getting this? Yes. Or, or you throw away your identity because of your weakness. I thought you let the weak say they're strong. I thought you proclaim righteousness and let righteousness live through you. Yes. Amen? Yeah. Okay, now listen. Now I hear this in my heart right now because somebody's, somebody's thinking this. You can raise your hand if you want when I say it because somebody's thinking this. Go to 1 John because somebody's thinking. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and make God a liar. Somebody in this room is thinking that real strong and God is stopping the service for you. How's that? Because it's the biggest holy cow and lie that the church has received. We preach the gospel in part. We pull scriptures out of context and do injustice with truth. And then we grow up hearing that and we start preaching that. And it's all we believe. And we've never maybe even looked into the face of God. And really understood what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. So let's look at it in context to help whoever's thinking that. And you're a brother and we love you. But please open your heart and don't judge things until we see. Amen? Amen. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have. See, I'm going to read a few verses before and a few verses after. Then we'll know what he's saying. True? Yeah. 
the most dangerous thing you can do is open your Bible and just read a scripture. And then piece that with another scripture. You read before and after. When you read a therefore, don't you ever just start with a therefore. You back up three, four, five verses so you find what it's there for. Serious. We've made a big mistake and Satan has played the body of Christ. And good men, good men have been deceived by this thing. And preach the gospel in part and make it say what it's not saying. And then when somebody comes along like me and preaches what I'm preaching on righteousness, what goes in your mind, because you're created to live by faith. And faith will defend what you've always believed. Whether it's right or wrong. You'll say, yeah, but if you, yeah, but if you say, oh, you scare me, brother. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and make God a liar. You, you, you're teaching false stuff. You, you, we all have sin. We all have sin. And you miss the whole point of righteousness. Because you're so worried about, well, we all have sin. We boast in our sin and our ability to fail instead of Him to make us righteous. The gospel, Romans 1, 16, is the power of God unto salvation for those that believe. For in it, righteousness, first the Jew, the Greek, for in it, righteousness is revealed. What's the power of God unto salvation? The righteous judgment of God that He sees me apart from sin. You've been justified through the resurrection of Christ just as if you've never sinned. God doesn't come in a cloud. He lives inside of us because He's made us clean and a house fit for a king. The Bible says, reckon yourself dead indeed to sin but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. And four places in that chapter, Romans 6, it says, you've been freed from sin, freed from sin, freed from sin. Why are we still fighting a battle that is already won through the blood of Jesus Christ? Why don't we submit to God and wear righteousness and live holy lives empowered by grace and show the world what we've become? Why would they want what you say you have if they can't see it in you? It's not a good testimony to the church and God's changing it. But countless people have met me and said, who are you? I've never met anybody like you and I just smile and say, there's a whole lot of us on the earth. There's actually a lot of us. No, I never met nobody like you. I said, no, there's a lot of us. We're not letting life rule us. Our barometer isn't our circumstances. People don't have the power to make us and break us. We're dead, remember? We're alive unto Him. The reason we wake up is to manifest His image, not to have a convenient day. If you wake up to have a convenient day, it's all about you and you'll be pummeled and life will be a roller coaster ride. And you are a sitting duck for the devil and he'll take cheap shots and keep you bound. (laughs) You go ahead and poke me if you want. You'll just get Jesus pouring out. (laughs) Go ahead and mess with me and see if you don't get ravaged with mercy and love and forgiveness. I will pray for you in the middle of the night and cry your name and Holy Ghost will come and get you when you ain't looking. (laughs) I ain't going to cry. They hurt me and I can't believe what they said. They shouldn't have did that to me. See, that's, that's thinking of you and only for you at the cost of others and you're missing why you're a Christian. The day of offense, bitterness, anger and frustration ought to be over forever for all of us because you don't live at the expense of men. You lay down your life for men. It's not I love you. Do you love me? It's I love you. Period. I love you. You love me? (laughs) We've reduced love to I need you. If you do everything I need, I'm fulfilled and blessed and happy. And if not, I'm falling apart because my identity is in you, not in Christ. It's needs driven. It's not even love. It's needs driven. Thousands of Christians driven by need every day because we don't understand why we're saved. Because we've made it a ticket to heaven instead of a transformation of life and perspective. I'm not saved for what you can do for me. I'm saved to become loved so I can love you and finally be free from you to love you. Come hell or high water to never let go of you and never give up hope for you because God never gave up hope for me. And since I've been forgiven so much, how can I forgive you of everything? Since I've been ravaged with mercy, how can I show you mercy? Why would I draw a line to that when love has no boundaries? Love never fails. It takes no account of a suffered wrong and it doesn't seek its own. But if we don't teach we're Christians to become love, we'll never become love. We'll be hurt Christians 
And the only difference between us and the world is we go to church and sing songs they don't. But we feel the same as they do and we act the same way as they do in crisis. The gospel's more powerful than that, people. <laughs> the gospel's all about transformation of life. A change of perspective. It says in Matthew 6, 22, 11, Luke eleven thirty four. 34, if my eye is single, if I see through truth, not wide view lens, multiple choice, if my eye sees the way, one way, my whole body's flooded with light. If God can change my perspective, he can change my life. If he can get me to look in the mirror and see what he has always seen, it's over, baby. This thing is on. <laughs> you get it? We're still trying to find affirmation from one another. We still need somebody to care for us, to show us we're special because we don't believe we're special. You find you're special through the gospel, not through people. Because people can fail you and they might not tell you what you need to hear that day. But God is always shouting it from his throne, through his son, through his blood. <sighs> Come on, I'm preaching at y'all. I hope you're getting it. Because I'm feeling good about it. Might as well get blessed with me because I'm going to get on the plane blessed. Somebody's going to get seat belted beside me today. And they're going to make a big mistake and say, so how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Happens all the time. <laughs> For the first minute or two, sometimes I think, oh God, why would I ask? And in about five minutes, I watch countless people. They sit there and cry because they realize they've never understood truth. They've never understood God. And some of them have grown up in the church. I've met countless people that have shifted and going after new age and all this stuff because they're hurt and disappointed and mad. And they're not even going after God because people have dictated who they are. He's the potter. Life's not the potter. You're the clay. Yield to his hand, not the hand of a merciless world that doesn't understand. Don't even submit yourself to people and friends to the way that you need them to be something so you're okay. That's deception. It's idolatry. To know the love of Christ is to be filled with all the fullness of God. To know the love of Christ is your fullness. You know what the word fullness means? Oh, you'll love this, Pastor. Did you ever study out the word fullness in Ephesians 3? It means a house with no empty rooms. Watch what else it means. A town with no empty houses. Yes, yes no more counseling. <laughs> yes! Prophesy. A town with no empty houses. Sounds like we can finally just love one another. You say, well, we need one another. We need one another to fulfill the great commission and the call of God to lock arms, to encourage daily, to keep on keeping on. Amen. But if you believe you need constantly encouraged, it's time to put your faith in God. If you think you need somebody to hold you accountable, it's time to just get your heart before the Lord. And there's times people can hold your hand and walk you through things, but your relationship with Jesus is second to none. Your time with Him, your ability to be in His presence surpasses every privilege of life. And that's where you find him and know him. And that's where he becomes real and alive. And now you're not trying to serve doctrine. You're in love. <laughs> See, that's what's wrong with me. If there's anything wrong with me, I'm in love. I have a relationship with the God of the universe by his choice. <laughs> he wooed me and called me out of darkness when I was running from him. Because I didn't know what I was doing. And if I knew what I was doing, I'd run smack into him long ago. But I ignored and I pushed and I shoved and people that were on fire for God, I avoided. And thought they were weird and out of balance and flaky. And I found every excuse to stay lost. And he never changed his mind about me. He never called my name in a board meeting and said, look, let's just give up on him. If he didn't change by now, he's never going to change. He knew who he made me to be. And when I was 33, he came and got me. And now I'm 50 and you can tell that I'm in love. You can tell I didn't put on a jacket today to try to impress you. You can look in my eyes and see I'm for real. Jesus is Lord. He's my father. He tells me stuff about folks. And then look at her. Just look at her. And then he blesses those folks. And loves those folks and multiplies who he is through my life. What an honor. And that's your destiny too. It's not because I'm a pastor or a preacher. That's what just men call me. That stuff would happen whether I preached in your church or not. Because I'm alive and people are around me. <laughs> See, you can't stop the trumpet blow now. You'd have to kill me. And what I've done and sown is still going to shout forever. You can't, you can't silence the voice of truth. They kill Stephen, but truth's still resounding. <laughs> the worst you could do is put me on a cross and you still didn't win. <laughs> yeah. See, I want you to like me, but you don't even have to. 
You can judge me, criticize me, and I'm going to leave town today with the presence of Jesus and peace in my heart and sleep like a baby and wake up and do it all over again tomorrow. <laughs> I'm going to live forever. <laughs> you can gossip about me, bash me on Facebook, you know, whatever you want to do. I know who I am, and it's too late to touch me now. <laughs> I'm having the time of my life. You get it? And I love your hat, dude. <laughs> I really do, man. <laughs> I know. I just, I'm being real. I like it. You look cool with it. <laughs> okay, first John, we got to do this, man, because I was there, and I see, I see how much gospel just ravages your heart. You're like trying to preach something, and you preach 20 things. This message we've heard from, from him. Who would we hear this message from? <laughs> what message is he talking about? The message that he just talked about that we're called into fellowship with God and his son. The apostle John is writing who supped with Jesus, who laid his head on his chest, who was there with Jesus personally. He said, him we've seen, we've handled, we've heard with our own ears, our own eyes, touched with our own hands. We declare him to you that your fellowship is with us and truly our fellowship is with him. So what he's doing is he said, I'm calling you into an intimacy that we have enjoyed and you're lacking nothing. You can have what we've known. It's powerful. So don't you dare say, well, that was for the apostles. You're deceived if you say that was for the apostles. He told his apostles in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations and teach those men to observe everything I've taught you. So if he's talking to Peter, James, and John, he's talking to me. It's simple. Just read the Bible. Let's stop arguing and just read the Bible. Well, that was for the apostles. Whatever was for the apostles is for us. It's a believer priesthood. He said, go in Mark 10. Here's another place. I can just confirm it out of the mouth of two or more witnesses. In Mark 16, he says, you go into the nations and those that believe and are baptized shall be saved. Those that don't believe shall be condemned. And these signs shall follow those that believe. He's not talking about the disciples. He's talking about the ones who come in through their message. And it's praying in another tongue. That one sure caused a monkey wrench in the body of Christ and caused us to dig rivers and streams and canals that God never dug. Because we've lost a few folks that we've prayed for and died and now we don't believe God heals everybody and all that, but the Bible still says, you lay hands on the sick, they recover. So do we honor our experience above God and His Word or do we honor God's Word till our experience lines up? Do we get so intellectual that we talk ourselves out of what He's saying but heaven and earth going to pass away and His Word's still speaking? Oh, come on now. See, God, Psalms 138.2, has magnified His Word above all His name. Because the integrity of who He is is found in His Word. We, we magnify our experiences and feelings above His Word. He's magnified His Word above all His name. We magnify our experiences and our feelings above His Word, and then we try to pray mechanically in His name. And don't even know the power and glory and integrity of His name because we haven't honored His Word above our experience. Oh, I'm preaching at you now. I hope you're getting this. You have to listen to that one on tape probably. But I promise you I'm preaching some stuff right there. Did you get that? Did that come out clear? Because I see it clear. We do it all the time. We say well, because Bill died and Bob lived, God heals some and doesn't heal all. That's not what Jesus declared. That's what life's trying to declare. That's what circumstances. Because a lot of times, guys, we pray because we're filled with fear. We pray because we're filled with anxiety. We pray because we're loving our own lives and it's still all about us. And we're driven by life. And then we mechanically apply God hoping to help. And when it doesn't happen, we blame God and question God and get more confused and draw back further. And we're less equipped and less prepared because life is dictating us. At what point do we honor who He is and what He said and what He lived above everything we've ever experienced? And if I lose a spouse, if I lose a child, if I lose a best friend, it's all the more time to lay on my face and get with God and let Him build up in me the power of the kingdom because He said it's true, He said it's possible, and who am I to doubt Him? And let's go after this thing till things change. You don't have to believe me, but I've seen thousands of people healed. But it's because of the tenacity of what I'm preaching to you right now. Because I don't know how to back up. I won't back up. My Bible says if I back up, it's to destruction. But if I go forward believing, it's to the salvation of my soul. Well, wait a minute. I thought I'm already saved. You are, but your mind needs renewed. You need to get out of the fall. You've been tutored by a lie your whole life. And you need renewed in the spirit of your mind and not conformed to the world, but transformed by seeing differently so you can prove God's amazing and perfect will. Come on, I'm preaching Scripture to you. Man, I feel passionate. Can you tell how serious I got in the last 10 minutes? This thing is in me. It's not because I'm mad at people. 
Because life is hanging in the balance and we're, we're deceived in many ways and we're talking ourselves into deeper jams. And our loved ones and people of the world need this kingdom and need this gospel. And he told us to go saying it's here, not talking around it and excusing it away. We're supposed to go declaring the kingdom of God yes. is here. Yes. It's at hand. It's within. Well, where is it? You're looking at it. Yes. I'm his best choice. I'm the best he's got. And he's okay with that. I ought to be too. You're the roster of heaven. I'm looking at the team of God. He called you, not me. I didn't make this up. He called you the body of Christ. He calls you the embodiment of Christ. And we want to let life tell us what truth is. Jesus' life is truth. If you can't find what you believe in Jesus' life, throw it out of your belief system. He's the visible image of the invisible God. Colossians 1.15. Hebrews 1. No one. No. God has spoken through the fathers, to the fathers, through the prophets in past times. But in these last days, Hebrews 1, in these last days, He has spoken through His Son, who is the express image of His person. It's Hebrews 1. John 14, Philip, how can you ask me? Show us the Father. Have you been with me so long, Philip, you still don't know me? Listen to what he said. How can you say that, Philip? Can you hear his heart? How can you say, show us the Father? Philip, have you been with me so long and you still don't see this? Philip, when you see me, you've already seen him. And we're still defining God through life. Well, I don't know why God allowed that. Well, I don't know why God let that happen. Well, boy, God sure works in mysterious ways. That's not even in your Bible. Yeah. That's not even a scripture. That's right. It's the most common thing you heard your whole life. God works in mysterious ways, brother. It's not a scripture! Yes. <laughs> Who's grew up hearing that your whole life? Yeah. Well, you know God, brother. He works in mysterious ways. <laughs> no. Paul said, the cat's out of the bag, the mysteries reveal. Yeah. All things are brought into the light, and Christ has revealed the truth of God's intent from the beginning of the world. The light has come. When light's here, there's no mystery. Now look, if you were the devil, wouldn't you try to blind the eyes of people? Wouldn't you try to deceive and get them to not see the truth and get them to fight amongst each other and argue and build different camps and not agree and let their doctrine be their experience and then fight over to protect your experience at the cost of your life and identity? Sure you would if you were the devil. And that's just what he's done. But it doesn't change the gospel. And it doesn't keep me from sitting on a plane and watching people get healed. I don't care if you don't believe in healing. People are getting healed. Just because it ain't happened through you doesn't mean God ain't doing it. I'm not being mean. I'm being real. Just because it wasn't my experience doesn't mean somebody ain't experiencing it. <gasps> Come on. You guys were sitting here last night. She didn't say a word. Except for asking for prayer for her mother. And I said, well, wait a minute. How are you doing? What, you have pain in your joints? You got like an arthritis thing going into you. I see it all over your body. She said, yeah. I said, you're trying to find that spot at night to sleep and roll and rest and find a place and it just ain't there. But I'm telling you, it's there tonight. I don't care if you sleep in your belly, your back, your side. Didn't I say this? I said, you will tell us tomorrow that you slept fine because I'm a man of God and I know when I hear God and I ain't playing. You're getting made whole. In fact, that cloud that has suppressed you and tried to tell you what you're not. For, isn't that how it happened? Yeah. Did she tell me a thing? Well, see, you say, well, I don't believe in the gifts. I'm sorry for you. The gifts are here. Yeah. That's right. Just because you didn't experience them don't mean they're not real. Right. I had a young man say, well, I don't believe in God. I said, you not believing in God makes him, doesn't make him not exist. Yeah. Right. Now, give me your hand and let's pray. <laughs> I, I got him. I got on him in West Virginia. He, he, a man had a car wreck, had a broken, withered up leg, and it was pulled up short, and, and he walked like this. And this old boy was from the mountains and they drug him to church. He's missing teeth. He's talking. He was a mountain man. And I loved that man. I looked at him. I just loved that man. I said, man, I got the honor of introducing him to Jesus. Not doctrine, theology, and my church heritage. Jesus. Because when I read my Bible, I know what Jesus does with that man. He doesn't preach a sermon to him. He gives him the kingdom. He doesn't preach theology in his camp. He gives him the Father. Now you tell me I'm wrong. That's what Jesus does every time in the Bible. <laughs> oh, 
we prayed for that man and we watched with our eyes the kinks come out of his leg. Now either I'm lying and I'm a twisted man and I need your help, honey. And I'm going to burn in hell for being a, a liar. Or I saw this. You have to decide what I'm telling is right or wrong. But we watched God take the kinks out of his leg and grow his leg and make his leg normal. I said, stand up, sir. The people that knew him said it was the first time they'd ever see him cry in his life. He walked back and forth like I walk, sat in a chair and sobbed. There's a young man sitting right here, just staring at the floor, just sitting with his arms crossed. A young man, please don't do this to your life and your heart. Don't be so cheap and sell out so easy. He's sitting here, the man's legs straightened here. I walked over and I said, hey, buddy, I ain't figured you out all night. I ain't heard nothing about you. I don't know what's going on. What's up with you, man? Where are you at right now? Where, what's going on in your heart? I just don't believe in God. I said, you're kidding me, right? Do you know how ridiculous that is? Yeah. That's exactly what I said. Yeah. I said, that is the weakest, most pitiful position you could possibly take in life. Right. I said, to just sit there and refuse to believe. God's moving 10 feet away from you. Yeah. And you're refusing to watch to allow yourself to be justified in your confession. And God is moving 10 feet of, uh, away because you're willingly holding on to a position and refusing to look and see. Yeah. And he got real, he felt foolish and it was intended. God wanted to make him feel foolish for his stand so that he would repent and change. Yeah. And I said, dude, you've got to be kidding me. I get down on my knee. Now, I'm not doing that to scold him, set him straight, and be a God in his life. I'm doing that because I love this boy, and he's yeah. being way whacked and deceived. In his... He's that close to God. Yeah. Yeah. And God was moving everywhere. Man, if you just opened your eyes a little bit last night when we were praying for folks, it wasn't too hard to see God yeah. was here. Yeah. True? Yeah. We got this one man comes up and cries and says, I was here last night. I didn't tell nobody. I'm telling you, God's doing something in this church. He's crying. He said, burning in my leg. I never felt nothing like it. May want to amputate my foot. My foot was crushed, pain nonstop. Couldn't even go to the bathroom. Da, 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 da. And he's, it's all going. We didn't pray for him. God's just in the room. Well, I don't believe in healing. I'm so sorry for you. The reason people say that is because they prayed for Aunt Millie and she died. They prayed for their spouse and they died. And intellect kicks in and human reasoning kicks in and builds a stronghold in their mind. And they can't get past emotional pain and sentimental pain and even to seek God in it. They just lock in to a, to a, to a truth that's not a truth. Yeah. And it's always because of natural evidence, natural pain, and physical loss. And we get caught loving our own lives and lifting our own experience above the Word of God. And we fail to surrender and die and love not our own life unto death. Why would losing my spouse challenge who God is when my spouse is a gift from God in the first place? I wouldn't even have a spouse and I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for Almighty. Right. Why is he at risk every time there's a problem? Every one of us in this room grew up hearing people blame God as soon as life went wrong. Yeah. Well, I don't know why God did that. Well, well, God loved me. Well, yeah, well, he wouldn't have let me go through that when I was a little girl if he loved me. Nonstop, I see it constantly everywhere I travel. People mad and bitter at God. That is the devil turning you from one so lovely who's the only one that gives life and helps and created you in his image. Yeah. Turning you from the very answer of your life. Yeah. And we rationally accept it. We rationally, reasonably accept it and live our whole life in darkness and bondage. And wish we weren't even alive and wish we would die. Why wouldn't we just see the fruit that that lies producing and realize something's desperately wrong? I don't know how I got on this strong message. Are you okay? Because yeah. man, I feel this thing. It's like... Durr. And I'm not angry at people. I can preach this stuff and still smile. Yeah. But I'm, it's serious. I'm, I'm not a fly-by-night guy. I'm not a weekend warrior. I didn't come here to preach. I came here to manifest Christ and to leave a deposit and impart truth. Because yeah. yeah. watch this. You, you don't hear this arrogant. You're hearing me wrong. If you're, I'm going to leave here and stay free and live the gospel and leave a legacy whether you buy in or not. That's right. And time will prove. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm so... Ugh. Unveiled. Boldness. Confidence. Don't throw, confidence and pride aren't the same thing. It says don't throw away your confidence. Because it's great reward. You have need of endurance. That means you need to go through hardship like a good soldier. And not let life define truth. 
You need to press through adversity because you're in the midst of a dark and crooked and perverse world. But you've partaken of His divine nature. And it's not even about you. It's about manifesting His glory. And come hell or high water, we don't back down and we don't bow. We live life and we live in love. You squeeze an orange, you expect orange juice. If you didn't get orange juice, it would be weird. Why don't we get Christ when we squeeze a Christian? If you squeeze a Christian, you ought to get Christ. It would be weird to heaven to get anything but Christ. I'm not picking a fight, but go ahead and squeeze me and see what you get. Yeah, I am so not afraid of a fiery furnace. I am so not afraid of a lion's den. Witchcraft has come and tried to destroy me. Witchcraft tried to kill my wife. And here I stand. And you see the passion in my heart? It's because I've been through fire. And I don't have a philosophy. I have the kingdom of God. I don't have a theory and a Sunday school children's church story for you. It's real. And Jesus just happens to be Lord. <laughs> oh, forgive me for being a wild man this morning. But it's just the way it is. And I love your hat. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, dude. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> must be part of the gospel. <laughs> Let me finish this. Forgive my passion. I can't, I can't help it. I can't help it. When you watch your wife get off of life support with brain damage, when you have your own leg, the doctors want to amputate, and the glory of God shoots through you and sets you free because you're not afraid. I can tell you a lot of things. You get in violent car wrecks that you had no control over. And instead of sitting on the curb crying, wondering why God let it happen to you. And what you did wrong and where you opened the door and why the devil's after you. You're just telling the world that you don't have identity. And that life rules you. No, you get out of your car and you love everybody in the accident. And you pray for everybody in that car. It's your brand new truck that the church bought you. People got together. Not even the, It was just people in the church. No, it wasn't an organized church. It was just people. Intercessors. You scary women intercessors. Yeah. You freak me out. Like we had some at church that I would just walk around. I'd say, good morning. No, no, it's all right. You don't have to touch me. No, I love you. Bless you, girl. Respect you. We had a handful of them. They got stars in their eyes. Not because they're flaky. Because they spend time with Jesus. Yeah. And they know stuff and hear stuff and they're spooky. They're spooky. Why? Because they've surrendered. They've submitted to Him. They could be doing a lot of other things, but they just find themselves somehow in His presence. They could be doing lots of other things and they find themselves in the middle of the night weeping on the floor. They could be sleeping. They choose not to. They're, they're scary women that I know. And she walks up to me and says, Hi, Brother Dan. And I'm like, Hey. <laughs> I'm afraid she's going to hug me. Something's going to get on me and I ain't going to be no good for nothing. <laughs> he said, I heard the Lord for you. The Lord spoke to me concerning you. I said, what did he say? And I thought, this girl missed this thing so bad. I thought, whatever. I wasn't demeaning her. She said, he said, you need a new truck. I said, honey, I don't need a new truck. I haven't even ever prayed for a vehicle. I haven't even prayed forever for material stuff. Never. I love my truck. It's 13 years old. I've had it forever. It's like a good fitting pair of clothes or something. And I said, if it dies, I'll pray for it to live. I, I don't need a new truck. I don't need a new truck. I ain't getting a new truck. She said, no, you need a new truck. Well, I didn't know that I was about to be released six years ago to travel at the level I'm traveling. I drive 25 to 30,000 miles a year. Now I'm flying so much I don't drive as much. But for these last bunch of years, I'm driving 25, 30,000 miles a year. My 13-year-old truck, unless it's supernatural favor, it's going to be in trouble after a while. He's going to get tired. Yeah. Well, I didn't know the season that I was stepping into, but the intercessors hear stuff. Yeah. People that pray. That's called loving not your own life unto death. You're, you could be doing other things, and you're praying for other people in the kingdom of God and God to overtake the earth. Whoa. Yeah. Keep doing it. So she said, well, you're getting a new truck because I heard the Lord. And I said, okay. And honestly, I was laughing like Sarah laughed. And I was like, whatever. And she said, no, you don't understand. I heard people's names. I called them and they freaked out and cried on the phone because they were hearing the same thing too at the same time. I said, yeah. now I thought, oh my God, this thing's happening. They started putting money in an account. And when it reached a certain amount, they gave it to me and said, get a truck. I never bought a new truck in my life. I never would. I'm not that kind of guy. I buy one two, three years old, feel like I'm saving a little money, feel like I worked a good deal. You always feel like you got a good deal. He always tells me, oh, I worked him down, man. You know, and he probably made 3,000 bucks on you. You know what I mean? You got a good deal, baby. 
But I would always do that, and then I'd run it till it would die and pray for it to live. It's serious. This truck was 13 years old. My last one was 11 years old. So I got this brand new truck. I go into the lot, and I drive off the lot, and I got a brand new truck. Brand new. It hit me when I left, because I wasn't coveting a truck. I didn't need a new truck. I was like, God, I need a truck. God, I bless me a new truck, 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 truck. <laughs> Never even thought about it. When she told me, I didn't even want one. And now I got one. And it hit me going down the road. I began to cry. I said, this is your love to me through people. This is, this is amazing. This wasn't a need. This wasn't something I'm coveting. But you gave it to me. And now I understand this is an amazing blessing. It's brand new. It's paid for. I had it three months. I'm going to a meeting. A lady flies through a stop sign and destroys it. Throws me up into a yard. I seen her coming through. I said, oh, Lord Jesus. I did. I think I was smiling. I got up on the wheel. I said, oh, Lord. I saw passengers and I didn't want to hit nobody because it was broadside. And I jerked the wheel as hard as I could. There was no time for brakes. I was, she just didn't look my way. She saw the traffic turning and she thought, oh, I can make it. And she zoomed across and forgot to look my way. And I'm right there. And all I felt like amusement park for two seconds. And everything got still. Well, everything's white. I'm thinking I'm in heaven. It's my airbag. It's... <laughs> Seriously, I'm just having fun. It was. Everything was white. But I knew it was my airbag because that thing blew up. Do you ever have an airbag on? Let's go. Poof. Whoa. The truck, as soon as the truck stops, I'm out of the truck in a millisecond and I'm over to the car. Yeah. Sir. I want to pray for you. I really must lay hands on you and believe for you. Sir, do you feel pain? Are you okay? I'm just shook up. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the blessing of your spirit. Holy Ghost, come into the, this man right now. Blah, blah, blah. Girls in the back seat, she's bawling, teenager. Whoa. I said, it's okay, honey. It's okay. Things happen. Accidents happen. The key is Jesus is Lord. And she starts whimpering. I blessed her. I breathed over her head. And I ran around to the lady driving. I said, hey, honey. I really want to pray for you, okay? She's just sitting staring in shock. Just staring. Honey, it's okay. Do you feel any pain? Do you have any? She's ignoring me. Just staring through the window. I have my little temporary tag still in the truck window. My truck's destroyed. She goes, oh my God. Oh my God. I hit a brand new truck. <laughs> it's a brand new truck. And she thought I was being rhetorical. Because you know how you say, well, it's just a truck. At least we're okay. Da -da -da. We say those lines. But the truth is, people say that stuff and they're still so mad that their trucks broke up and they're so inconvenienced and insurance headaches and, oh, why didn't they just stop at the sign? You know, they walk up this way, didn't you see the sign? If I saw the sign, we wouldn't be sitting like this. <laughs> worse yet, worse yet, us Christians do this. We look at the new truck. Ah. <sighs> And then we turn and go, no, no, it's okay. Hey, it'll be all right. And you already let them know that you're very inconvenienced, very troubled, and very pressured. Jesus does not put weight on men. He takes weight off of men. And the last thing she needs is Mr. Christian to be troubled by her mistake. This lady needs understanding. She needs release. She needs love. And she truly needs her life to be valued more than that new truck. Or I'm trapped in religious deception. God, I bind the devil. He ain't going to steal from me. And all of a sudden I make it some spiritual thing and forget about the value of people. And, and this truck was a gift from you. And ain't nobody robbing from me. And yeah, 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 yeah. Or whatever. You could take it ten different ways, Christians think. But I'll tell you how fun it was. When she said, I hit a new truck. I said, it's okay, honey. It's just a truck, truly. It's just a truck. The important thing is that you're okay and I want to pray for you. She glared at me. She turned at me, Holly, and she said, You don't understand. That is a brand new truck. And that driver is going to be so mad at me. <laughs> you see how people think and feel? Yeah. You see the load that men carry? Yeah. Guilt, response. It was such a joy. I took her little chin. And I said, you look at me, honey. I am the driver <laughs> of that truck. And watch what she did. God bless you. And I reached in and held her on my shoulder. And rocked her on my shoulder. The girl in the back's whimpering again. I said, can I get in the back seat? She said, yeah. I slid in the back. She's facing this way, laying against the door. I said, come here, honey. Come here, baby. 
She turns and crawls on me and lays on me and I hold her like I'm her daddy. And I whispered, honey, it's just an accident. Things will work out and it'll be okay. The key is that you're okay, that you're fine. Jesus is amazing. He guards, he protects. We keep our trust in him. Peace come upon her now. And she, and she just laid on me and was wiped out. The policeman came. I got out. He come over. They said, you were the driver. Yeah, I'm the driver, man. He's like, okay, you okay? Oh, yeah, man, I was over. I prayed for everybody. And da -da -da. <laughs> he said, man, I appreciate your attitude. I said, what are you talking about? There's no other option. What other attitude is there? <laughs> Jesus is king, man. He came and died on the cross and forgave me of everything I've done wrong. How can I show mercy to the world? What, do you think I'm going to have an issue with somebody because they ran a stop sign by mistake? You think I'm going to give them the power to be Lord and ruin my life and day? Come on, that's so petty. When you hear me talking like that, you realize how petty it is. But yet it's been our reality. And we justify it. And some of us still hold on after hearing this kind of message, still hold on to the right to feel those ways and it doesn't produce life. Watch the glory of this. You never know how much your life impacts people. This 19-year-old fireworker come up. I'm a rare breed. I don't have a computer. It's not on purpose. I'm just not into computers. And I don't carry a cell phone. It freaks the whole world out. I say, look, I'm not lacking anything. I carry Jesus and it's awesome. I'm not against cell phones. It's just I'm a very pursued man. And if I had a cell phone, I wouldn't even be able to give my heart to you when we're driving. Anything, my pocket be buzzing. People be texting, calling because we don't know how to restrain that stuff. We find identity in technology and we abuse it and we make ourselves feel busy. Wow. We spend more time on Facebook than seeking his face because we find identity in Facebook. And I'm not saying Facebook's wrong. I'm saying you need to know where to draw lines and you need to live with temperance. And not let something so good as technology become a curse yeah. and, and absorb you. So I don't ha not have a computer because I believe it's the one-eyed beast and it's the Antichrist. I just don't, I'm not, I don't have a cell phone on purpose because I've never had one and I don't need one. It's my choice. It's not a judgment against you and I don't see, I've borrowed my friend's cell phones to call home. I'd pay you if you need me to. I carry a calling card. I, I never have a problem with it. I've lived without one forever. So I didn't have a cell phone. So I asked this fire worker. I said, man, is that a cell phone on your belt? What kind of plan you got, buddy? Do you got some unlimited? I'll give you a couple bucks. I need to make a call to my wife. I don't have a phone. Oh, sure. He's 19 years old. I asked him how old he was. I said, you're pretty young, man, doing this job. He said, I'm 19. I said, God bless you for what you do, man. And I'm just being me. I'm just me. Yeah. I'm not standing there in the aftermath of my new truck getting oh. busted up. <laughs> I'm just me. Yeah. I'm just me. God forbid when the metal crashes, you try to apply pastor sermons. Sister, uh, okay. Okay, I'm not supposed to be moved. I'm supposed to be happy. See, you're too late. Okay, I'm supposed to love. I've got to walk in faith. Hey, everybody. That's plastic. <laughs> the word becomes flesh. I take his phone. I call on his phone to my wife. I'm staring. I didn't even know he's watching. People watch. People listen. They get touched by things and it gets their attention. Even if they think you're strange, they'll watch because they think you're strange. <laughs> Serious. Now, I'm not bothered by that. I know I'm not strange. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> watch this. He's watching. I'm talking to my wife. I don't even know he's there. It's just me. And I'm on the backside of my truck. I just waxed it in the morning and washed it. It's so pretty. That truck was sweet, baby. <laughs> the other side is... Right against my door, smashed the whole thing in. Toyota builds a good truck, man. I could have made a commercial. It didn't come in on me at all. I guess it was Jesus. Smashed the bed in a foot and a half. It was, a, it was messed up. So I'm standing there. I said, hey, honey. Yeah, aren't you supposed to be in a meeting? Well, I'm getting there. I said, I need you to help me. I said, your sister's still over at your mom. She said, yeah. See if she'll swing by and pick me up because I'm only two, three miles from your mom. I said, like, what's going on? Well, a lady come through the intersection. She said, your new truck. I said, it's all right. I said, everybody's fine. It's okay. I said, but I really need her to come. So can you call her and, 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 and get her to come and pick me up? She said, I will. I said, this cell phone number, just call the kids right here. You just call him back, let him know. She said, I'll do it right away. So I said, well, I'll just hold his phone. I said, she's going to call me back. I turn, I look, he's standing right there. I said, she's going to call me back. Can I just wait until, that's fine, do what you got to do. So she calls me back. Kathy's coming. She's going to pick you up. I said, honey, she said, Are, is everybody fine? I said, yeah. I said, you know, this is the one pretty truck, man. I said, it's sitting sideways in the yard. It looks like it's for sale. 
<laughs> I said, I'm on the backside, honey. I watched this thing. You know how sweet it looks. This thing is beautiful. I said, but man, you go on the other side. Oh my goodness, ouch. And I'm talking just like that, laughing. And I said, it's, she said, do you think it's totaled? I said, oh, it's got to be totaled. I said, it's really bad. And I said, well, okay, love you, see you, bye. I click. I turn, I said, hey, buddy, here's your phone. Thank you so much. So I'm there, and an officer's finishing up some things. Kid comes over, he pulls my sleeve. Now, you don't do this. Emergency fire worker doesn't do this. There's no need to do this. Watch. Things have statements behind them. He pulls my sleeve, and he says, excuse me, sir. I said, yeah. I just want to let you know I'm leaving. I'm going to be going now. I'll see you. You know what he was saying? You spoke into my heart today. You res I respect you. You've touched yeah. my life more than you know. Yeah. I'm honoring you. I'll see you. And he shook my hand and he walked down the street. I went, whoa. Mm -hmm. Three months later, I'm doing a healing service down in New Bridgeville, 10 miles from where the accident happened. I'm doing a healing service, preaching to a group of people about this size, preaching and being just like you see me. And I'm, we're going to pray for the sick and we're going to tear it up. And Jesus is faithful and I'm excited. So I'm here pouring out my heart and I'm teaching on becoming love and I'm teaching stuff. And this man stands up in the back, back where you are, Ken. He's in the very back row and he stands up, right? See, people say people in the back. You know, the anointing's in the back too because he's back there. <laughs> so the man stands up and he's just standing while I'm preaching. I say, yes, sir, what's on your heart? Do you need... And he said, I just want to say something. I said, sure. He said, were you in an accident in early April? Such and such a road? I said, yeah. He said, I don't think you would recognize me out of uniform. Wow. <laughs> he said, but I just want to say that I was on the scene of an accident. I was the officer that attended the call. And I want you to know that every man, thing this man is telling you is true. Because I was there in the heat of the moment when his truck was crushed and I saw nothing but smiles and love and forgiveness and prayer for everybody on the scene. And honestly, as an officer, I have never seen anything like it in my life. And I'm letting you know this man's for real. And it affected my heart and I have never come to church in my life. And this friend asked me to come to this healing service and the only reason I came because I was so affected by the experience that day that I thought maybe my impression of church isn't right. Maybe there's other people like him. Him. And I come down here and he's the one preaching from the pulpit. And I want you to all know this man is for real. And I said, well, thank you for the live commercial, buddy. Because <laughs> see, I don't need accolade. I don't need affirmation. I live with my own conscience. I look into my own face in the mirror. I sleep with me, wake up with me, and I know who I am. And I don't care if you judge me, misread me, get presumptuous. I know who I am. Yeah. And ain't no secrets, ain't no closets. I'm so squeaky clean standing here, it's ridiculous because of the blood of Jesus. There ain't nothing in the newspaper popping up tomorrow, no surprises, no broken heart to the body of Christ because Pastor Dan was this and that and the other. No, I'm a man of God and I'm not ashamed of it. Amen. Yeah. So squeaky clean, it's scary. If you listen in the spirit, I say, Wee, 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 <laughs> The blood of Jesus is amazing. Yeah. It put integrity in me. Yeah. It put honor and discipline in me. Yeah. Diligence in me. Yeah. I'm not a self-made man. I'm not biting my lip to live right. The gospel is molding me. Shaping me. Forming me in Christ Jesus. Yeah. I'm not trying hard. Do I look tired? Am I sweating from my brow? Am I biting my lip to perform? No. I'm a work of grace. And all I do is believe what he says. If he says he loves me, it's settled. You'll never talk me out of it. Ain't a devil in hell can change my mind. If he says he forgives me, then I'm forgiven and I'm always going to be. Guilt, condemnation, shame, the three lies and tools of the devil. And Christians live with those three things every day and it's tragedy. Guilt says I'm not forgiven. Condemnation says I'm worthy to be judged. Shame says it's still who I am. And they're all anti-gospel. Yeah. <sighs> Got to make a tree good so the fruit could be good. I'm so sorry I'm late now. I can tell I'm late. What time do I need to end? What time do you usually are done by 1230? I didn't even ask you. No, well, no, there's children, there's families. No, no, no. No, it's not a religious spirit. Don't try to cast it off of me. It's caring for people. <laughs> Nothing will come off of me. I need to know what time do you normally end? What time? Because you have children, church, child care, and families here. Is it normally about 1230 or something? Or am I already late? Yeah, you lie, you fry. You
Can I have 10 minutes? Can I have 10 minutes? We got we to gotta do this. Now, there's always zealots. There's always zealots in the Congress. Yeah, go all day. And the people in the back and sometimes stuck in the middle is like, oh, my God. He doesn't need encouraged. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> I got to finish this though, because I heard someone thinking this a while ago. This is the message we've heard from the beginning, from him, I mean, and declare to you that God is light, that God is light, and in him is no what? Where's God live? And where else does he live? In you. And God is light, and in him is no darkness. Whoa, dude, ye are the light of the... Isn't that amazing? And that's not blasphemy and heresy. Look, if we say, if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, you might think that's just the act of sin. You might think that's just walking in defiled ways. Walking in darkness is walking in a lack of revelation. It's walking in unrighteousness. It's walking in sin consciousness. It's, it's walking apart from the finished work of Christ. Walking in darkness is walking in a lie. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. Practicing the truth is living the life of righteousness. It's walking free and unveiled and open faced before God and before men. It's loving God and loving people. But if we walk in the light, oh man, as He, He's inviting us in church. He's saying, I've made no difference between you and me. I've allowed you to become one with me. If you walk in the light as He is in the light. You show me limitation there. He says you walk in love in Ephesians 5. Just as Jesus loved. You show me limitation there. He's saying my heart can be one with His. He's saying my nature can manifest Him. Because in the beginning He made us in His image. And the lie of sin came and caused that to die. But Christ died to cause that to live. Oh! Yeah. <gasps> I preached it the other night. He got so disfigured on the cross. He got so beaten that you couldn't recognize him. The Bible teaches he, had, he was unrecognizable. He was marred more than any of the sons of men. Why did he have to get beat beyond description? Because when sin got done with man, he didn't look anything like he was created to be. So Jesus came and took on that unrecognizable appearance so we could get back our rightful identity. It's a great parallel. If we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have... Fellowship with one another. We don't hide, live in the dark and secret and in and out and don't want no. Fellowship with one another. Eyeball to eyeball stuff. Yay, into me see. Yay. Intimacy, face to face, into me see. Not, hey, honey. I picked up a prostitute one night, a functioning active prostitute because I was looking for a girl who backslid and went on the streets. I quit preaching and left church to find her. It broke my heart. I went on the streets to get her. I said, John, you close out the service. I've got to find her. I said, she, she, she respects me. She will listen to me. She was doing good. She just... She just believed a little lie. She just got itchy. She just, it just, she just fell away. You don't judge her. You don't hate her. You run and get her. Yeah, you go love her. You go tell her your life is more than this decision you're making. You go get her. It's the only time I was carded in my entire life with an ordination card. A prostitute asked me to verify I was a pastor. <laughs> I've been in emergency rubber rooms. I've been in jails, hospitals. I've never been asked for verification. And a prostitute carded me. And, and she's not even a prostitute. She was just, at, uh, at that time, she was, a, she was functioning as a prostitute. She's more than that. But it was amazing because I'm sitting at this crack house and I'm looking and I'm thinking which one to go in and I'm saying, Lord, where is she? So I don't have to just go through all these things and if I have to, I have to. Somebody will get touched along the way, but I am finding this girl. And by the time I'm praying and looking, this girl peeks in my truck and says, Hey, honey, what are you doing in this part of town? And I'm already emotional. I'm already caught up in Jesus. I'm already living Christ. I'm already after this one girl. And I just it didn't, I didn't even think about it. And it would have shocked anybody. I reached up and snatched her arm. 
And tears blasted out of me. I said, that is not the question, dear. The question is, what are you doing in this part of town? Because your life is more than what you're living and giving yourself to. And you obviously have no idea who you are. You were created before the foundation of the world. Seen in the heart of God. And I just, ah! She said, it was like a trap. She was, I've had her. There's a leg hold in the Holy Ghost. Hey, she came in my truck. Yeah. She didn't find what she thought she was going to find. And she said, who are you? I said, the question is, who are you? Not me, you. Because, dear, I know who I am. But I can see you have no clue. Or you wouldn't dishonor your value. You wouldn't give yourself to men. You wouldn't ta, ta, ta. Oh. I said, you are so much more. I kept telling her so much more. She started bawling. And I said, now listen, don't you play me. I know you know her. I said her name. Please, she said, why would I show you where she is? Because I love her just like I love you. I ain't playing. I'm on this thing. She said, oh. I said, I need you to get in my truck. Now that's a doozy. <laughs> See, love doesn't have boundaries. There's a, no seminary in the world that would tell you to do this. I didn't think about it, and I didn't project it, and I didn't think, well, I don't care what the church thinks. Get in my truck. It, it was spontaneous. It was innocent. I didn't even think about it. But here's the sad part. Here's the sad part about the church. You take a church member, see her get in my truck, and what do they do? Think the worst immediately when love believes the best. We've been so scarred and marred of innocence that as soon as you see something like that, you believe the worst. Next thing you know, instead of approaching me in private, you call three, four friends crying and say, intercede, there's a prostitute, Dan just pulled away in the car, I can't believe it. Who, Dan? You're kidding me. We all love him. He's been a voice in the city. He's been integral for years. I can't believe this. Oh my God, Dan. And you already got me a heathen, defiled, a hypocrite. Instead of going, wow, she got in his truck? Man, she's in for it. <laughs> you know he got something up his sleeve. He going to pull her in a back alley and he jump me and say, woo! <laughs> That girl's getting it. And it ain't what you think. <laughs> See, why isn't it easy to think that? Why isn't it easy to say, I know his integrity, I know his life. If he put that girl in his truck, it ain't what you think. And it's got to be God. And I refuse to believe the worst. And I refuse to gossip and spread it around. And I refuse to fall apart and cry and be presumptuous. I understand avoid the appearance of evil. It wasn't something that I did in spite I did in the moment. She said, how do I know you're a pastor? I said, honey, it doesn't even matter if I'm a pastor. I, I love her, but I am a pastor. She said, well, I need to know you're a pastor. I said, why? I just need to know. So I gave her my driver's license and my ordination card through the window. And she holds it in the street light and affirms me and gets in my truck. And I'm like, woo, I made it. I passed. First time I was ever carded, man. We're driving down the road, and this is why I'm telling you this story. I'm driving down the road, and she said, would you stop looking around? You need to be more inconspicuous. You make yourself too obvious. I said, honey, I came out of living in the shadows a long time ago, and I'm living in the light. I've got nothing to hide. I don't lurk in the darkness anymore. Do you realize how bound you are living in the dark, slurking in the shadows? You are more than what you're living, girl. I just pounded her and pounded her with gospel. I'm looking all around, and she's telling me to hide. I'm done hiding. There's nothing to hide. No one lights a lamp and puts a basket over it. Let's stop being basket-headed Christians and let our lights so shine. Let's stop being theology-driven and all we have is doctrine to give people. How about giving them love and light and life and glory and victory? How about getting in the city and giving somebody something instead of a track, and I love you, Jesus, twice a year and feeling like you're a Christian? <laughs> oh, God, because that happened to us. We'd go in twice a year, call it Storm the City. Yeah. <laughs> Get in the parking lot, shut up, Ain't prayed for the city for six months, but we're in the circle because we're Christians and we all hand out tracts, tell people Jesus loves them. Ain't even prayed for nobody and interceded outside of our little circle for months. And we go in there and hand out tracts. And the first man they gave a tract to, excuse me, sir. Did you hear the good news? What's that? Jesus loves you. Oh, thank you. I believe he does, but I don't believe you do. They said, excuse us? Ooh, his heart's hard. 
No, I don't believe you do. I believe you're a church group, probably out here annually, biannually, making yourself feel good about what you say you are. I don't believe you love me. When's the last time you handed a tract to somebody apart from your little organized group and you told somebody Jesus loved you apart from your little organized group? See, this isn't who you are. It's what you're doing and you're just trying to make yourself feel better about yourselves. And you guys need to go back to your church and get a grip and get a clue because you don't know what love is. And I said, to the cars! <laughs> he said, Pastor, don't you let him run us off the street? Don't you be so... To the cars! Because if you can't hear God in that, you have no ears. <laughs> so she pointed Wanda out to me. and There's two dealers that are working her out of the alleyway. And they're standing right there. And you just don't walk into those situations. You don't. And it's amazing. I, I, she said, do you see? He, she said, now just glance. Don't you get me in trouble? And I said, I, I honor that. She said, you just glance. You see that silhouette in the alleyway? That's her. I started crying. She said, don't you drop me off on this corner. They'll see me get out of your truck and they'll know. she'll know I told on you. She'll be in my face. And I said, what do you want me to do? She said, pull me back in that alley. This is getting good now. She's in <laughs> pastor's truck. A lot of people know me. Now we're going in the alley. Never even thought about it. You want to go in the alley? We'll go in the alley. We went right in the alley. I said, listen. Don't get out of my truck. Tell me why you do what you do. For my babies, for my babies. I got to support my babies. I said, don't you tell me that. You can work at Walmart and support your babies. It's a habit. It's an addiction. And it's because you have no esteem and you have lost your value, your honor, and sight of who you are. And I want to pray for you and I want to bless you. She said, why do you, why do you love me? She says, because you're made in God's image and you just don't know it. And I took her to me and I held her in an alley, a dark alley, and held her as close as I would ever hold the closest women in my life, like daughter and wife, and just held her because it's just all right. And I just prayed over her and rocked her and prayed. She was crying uncontrollably. And then I wrote down a phone number of a girls' ministry, Christian New Life for Girls Ministry, and said, please call them. And please get help. I don't know what she ever did with it. But she got out of my truck and walked up the alley just bawling. And I'm believing God did something in her life. Amen. And I pulled up in the, got my girl in the truck. I'm between two drug dealers going, <laughs> come here. Get in the truck. She said, go, go. I'm not leaving. I love you. That's just what I said. I'll get out and come in and get you if I have to. And these two drug dealers are standing there like I'm not even sitting there. That's unheard of. They were like, what's, what's, what's up with the girl, man? What? No, nah, man, she don't hit the road, man. Get out of here. They didn't say nothing. They're acting like I'm not even sitting there. I said, I ain't leaving. You might as well. I'm coming in to get you if you don't come to me. I love you way too much to drive away. She goes, oh. As soon as she got in my truck, cried uncontrollably because she knows I love her. <gasps> the only reason I told you that story it's because so many people are living in the dark and living inconspicuous. And we need to come out and live loud and live bold in the Christ. Christians that don't know who they are and just hoping God fixes their broken things and takes them to heaven, stay self-condemned and stay in identity crisis and live in the dark. And it ought to not be. We've got to come out and walk in the light as He is. And if we do that, we'll have fellowship with who? one another and watch this and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us of how much sin so are you cleansed from sin so are you a sinner are you cleansed now watch so you just got cleansed of all sin through the blood if we say we have no sin he's saying that in context of needing the blood and being washed and coming out and walking the light what he's saying is if you say you have no need of the blood If you have no need of the blood, if you're saying you don't need to come out of the darkness into the light, you're deceived and you're making God a liar because he said all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if you say you have no sin and have no need of the blood, you're deceived. Now watch. But if you confess your sin, watch this. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to what? 
forgive you of how many sins? Our sins. And cleanse us of all. If you're cleansed of all unrighteousness, what's the only thing that's left? Can you be both? So if you're cleansed of all unrighteousness, then you're completely righteous. So are you sin conscious? Are you defiled? Are you a sinner or a saint? Wow. Now watch. He goes again and he clarifies verse 8 with verse 10. Because he said, if we say we have no sin, in other words, I don't need the blood. Now in verse 10, he changes it a little. If we say we have not sinned, that's what he's saying in verse 8. If we're saying we don't need the blood and we have no sin, then we're deceived. So if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word isn't even in us. Now watch, he's preaching righteousness. He's preaching walking in the light. He's preaching the power of the blood. So the very next verse in chapter 2, he says, My little children, these things I write to you so you may not sin. But if you say you're not, you're deceived and you're a liar. Come on, he's not saying that. He said, I'm writing these things so you may not sin. He's not saying, but you're always going to. We have pulled that one little verse out of context and hurt the body of Christ terribly and given us a warrant and a permission and justification for weakness in the flesh. And then we sing songs. I don't know why he'd love me like he loves me. Because he made you in his image and he's never lost sight of you and you're valuable and worth his blood. You're the pearl of great price. You're the treasure hidden in a field. And he paid everything to obtain you. It's not a mystery anymore. Yeah. Yeah. The cross doesn't expose your sin, it removes your sin. Amen. The yeah. cross exposes your value. Come on. He didn't die on the cross because you're a sinner. He died on the cross because you're a lost son or daughter. Yeah. Yeah. And he came to seek and save that which was lost. And redeem us back unto him. Yeah. Now nobody, no preacher ever told me the gospel that way until I was 33 and Holy Ghost did in my bedroom. It wrecked me forever. I write these things to you little... Children, so you may not sin, not when, if, and if, not when, and if anyone sins. He's not even opening the door. He just says, and if you do. Man, don't fall apart and lose your identity. No, you have an advocate. He's Jesus, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the mercy for our sins. And look, this is why an unbeliever can be healed. This is why God will show grace and give a word of knowledge to unbelievers. Why? Because not only your sins, but the sins of the... Whole world he paid the price for. So mercy is speaking from the throne of God. The blood speaking better things than the blood of Abel. Do you get it? It's a big deal. I went way late and I very much apologize. I really do apologize. You can't tell me no. I'm sorry. I did. I went too late. I can feel it. We get to pray. Because uh, you know how it is with me. I say I'm done and we're just getting rolling. So I'm really in trouble right now. You have no idea I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. You're so good. I love you so much. Your husband's up there doing the same thing you're doing. You guys are one. You guys are on track. You're thinking alike. You are so awesome. Listen. You have to learn something and understand something. Hold yourself to something. What you do with a message like this and what you do with the gospel every time you hear it is your decision. You are the steward of your heart. I'm going to be real plain with this thing. I'm a simple guy. Did you notice I'm simple that I don't talk deep? I, if, it wasn't, if, it was, if, it was, if it wasn't simple, I ain't in. If a child doesn't understand it, I don't think I'm preaching the gospel. You're the steward of your heart. Now you can talk yourself around what the cross says and what the gospel preaches with human reason, feelings, and memories from yesterday. And you can contest and fight the truth, but it's always the truth. And you can rob yourself of the blessing of receiving truth. Or you can, by faith, say, he has to love me. He has to forgive me. He has to. He'd have never died. He shed his blood. I have to. My life is worth living. Wow, I've lived a lot. I put it on everybody else. I've demanded and expected from everyone else. And I need to receive from him. He's the one where help comes from. He, it's not that I don't need people in the sense of that, hey, I'm on an island by myself in God. I don't need people to establish my identity. We need one another to fulfill the big picture will of God. 
but I don't need you to fulfill my identity. My identity is through Christ. He says, how can you believe you who receive honor from one another? Because <laughs> you'll always be failed. You'll always be under pressure. You'll always be insecure. You'll always be looking for what men can do for you and how they can build you up. I said the other night, you only serve in a ministry to feel better about yourself so people affirm you. It's nice when somebody comes up and says, man, you're awesome. But I'll tell you what's healthy, when you don't need him to say that. And when you don't need him to say that, and he goes up and says, Tim, you're awesome. And he says, well, man, thanks. And all of a sudden, there's no damage done. If he needs me to say that, and I'm doing it just to keep him alive, I'm feeding an emotional twist. I'm enabling a lie. And I'm another person in line. It's just the same as an addiction. It's just another hit. It's another rush. I don't need you to ever thank me. And when you sincerely do, I don't need you to. I can understand your heart and receive it. But I really don't need no one to ever thank me for nothing. I'm having the time of my life. I didn't sacrifice to come here. You say, well, you haven't been home. I am home. This is family. And I'm going to be on a plane today, and I'm going to be hugging family in a minute. It's just been three days. He's in the tomb that long. He came out sooner or later. I'll get back home. I ain't been three days in the grave. I've been three days with family. Yeah. Having the time of my life. Can you tell I have fun? Yeah. Does it look like I've been strained and challenged and run dry? Donnie couldn't even wear me out. He tried yesterday, but he couldn't. <laughs> we're going to get up a little early. We're going to go meet. We're going to go. We're going to. We're going to hang. We, same clothes all day. Never got me back. Kept me out. Don't you feel bad? I'm having fun with you. You don't feel bad. Oh, he says, yeah, I did it on purpose. I said, Are we, oh, wow, we got to go from here right back to the church for service. Yeah. We get over to the hotel. I want you to pull your heart out a little. I've been pouring my heart out all day. <laughs> this is funny. He wants more. I laughed. I said, sure. Did I look tired? I got so pumped. It was more intimate. It was more personal almost because of some of the things I talked about at the hotel. Yeah. And he finally gets me home at midnight and lets me go to bed. Two o'clock the morning before. And we got to get up early because we got to leave a little early because we want to meet, we want to get coffee, we want to pray for somebody, we want to stop over here and maybe bless. I said, oh, you are so awesome. He loves people. <laughs> and I ain't going, man, I came in town. I ain't got to give me my privacy. I got to seek the Lord. And I got to, <laughs> I live with the Lord. Amen. I'm always ready. He could translate me right now into a group of about 10,000 people. I'm ready to roll. Now, I'd be a little shocked that I translated. I'd have to get over that for a minute. <laughs> but I'm ready to roll. Because you live with a message, not a sermon. It's a message in your life. Amen? Amen. I'm going to pray over you guys, okay? Listen, Jesus loves us. Every one of us. You couldn't have failed enough to be excluded. The fact that he shed his blood says your life's worth living. <laughs> Hi, princess. I don't want to squeeze her all last night and today. Soon you're going to let me hug you. I know you are. You're going to let me hug you today. Aren't you? Going to let me hug you today? What do you mean, no? you got to let me hug you. I love you so much. I just could squeeze you. <laughs> She's teasing me now. I want to pray for you guys. Listen, what God's doing here is amazing. You people are amazing. You've got people, whether you know it or not, you've got people committed to prayer. You got leaders that are hearing God and I see people that are locking arms. There is something really good going on here. And I don't just hype and say that stuff. I, I fear God too much to just say that stuff. I'm not trying to get you like me. You already do. <laughs> no, I'm just being funny. Serious. There's something good going on here. Stay focused. and Keep your eyes on why you gather. Don't just turn inward and make it about what God can do among us. It's what he can do in us and through us. It's not just what he can do for us. It's not just him meeting our needs. It's him changing our lives. Yeah. So when you gather, don't ever just gather because it's service time. Don't ever just come here for somebody to love you. Come here to love. Yeah. Come here to encourage. Come here to give and bless and serve. When you sing, sing together with all your heart. Worship him and honor him and let Jesus overtake us. Amen? Amen. Please don't just rally your kids and get them here because it's Sunday. You'll teach your kids religion. You'll teach them that going to church is Christianity instead of being Christ-like. 
You know, a lot of good families that didn't understand taught their children that church attendance was Christianity. And the children got hard and bitter and the parents fought and didn't understand and cried and kept saying, you got to get back to church, you got to get back to church. And it wasn't even the issue. I know it's right to come. I'm not saying don't go to church. Gather yourselves together. Don't ever forsake the gathering of the brethren. But what I'm saying is our focus, our Christianity isn't church attendance. It's living in Christ. And then the parents get so worked up and fall apart and they're striving and pushing and pressing and Bible bashing and don't even realize what they're doing. And they're not even manifesting Christ. And then the other one, then they have a real excuse. To, well, you know, you see what I'm saying? So man, don't let that happen in your life. When you come here, and these are just my final just encouragements and charges before I leave. Because I'm leaving and you guys are here. When you come here, make sure you always know why you're coming. You steward your heart and you say, why am I going this morning? Because some days you wake up and you feel like sleeping in. Who ever felt that way? Like, boy, I could sleep in. <laughs> He's quick to raise his hand. <laughs> you came late, man. I watched. You came late. You, you slept in, man. Don't play that with me and raise your hand. <laughs> no, he was just saying, this morning. <laughs> and I did it too, Pastor. <laughs> but see, you, you, you don't just come because it's regimen, it's tradition, it's religion. You don't just come because it's the right day and people are expecting you. You come with the right heart and you'll always receive the fullest rewards. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm being serious about this thing. Man. Even you, you girls, bless you girls. I don't want to focus on you, exploit you from Teen Challenge, but be careful you're not just going through a program because it's what you need to get straightened out or people are expecting of you or because they want you to. Man, do it to know Jesus, to find Him, to be embraced by Him, to yeah. love Him. Yeah. It's not about fulfilling a program. It's about knowing God. Yeah. It's the greatest privilege of your lives. I'm so proud of you. You have no idea. I teach in a ministry just like Teen Challenge every month. I'm doing their graduation this year. It's the 40th anniversary, and they called me and asked me to do the graduation. I said, I'm going to be a mess, but I'll do it. I go through so many Kleenexes, it's crazy. They're coming down the aisle in their white gowns graduating. Some of them healed of hepatitis, families restored, healed of STDs that are incurable. We have lost count of this stuff. Scars that are on their bodies from dark seasons of their life, gone because of Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> We ain't playing. We ain't just preaching the gospel of salvation. Taking you to heaven someday. We're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached all over the earth. And then he will come. We've made it. Pray your prayer to get your name in a little bookie. Well, that book's real and my name's there and so is yours. But that is not our motivation. Our motivation is him and the change of our lives. So I commend you. Run well, girls. I might not even see you again. But I'm proud of you. You run well and you go after Jesus and you let him love you. And you let his word become your truth. And you let it grow greater than your feelings and greater than men's advice. You get to know him because he loves you. Every one of you. Amen? I'm going to pray over you corporately, okay? And... Uh, I want to bless this congregation. And I'm not sure, and I know there's certain expectations, and it's not about me. You know how I feel about I just It's not about all the sick lining up me praying for everybody. I, we are the body of Christ. How are we going to just start praying for people in the streets and highways and byways if we don't just start, even around one another, just start praying and loving one another? So if you're sick in your body today, don't you leave without prayer. We'll, we, we can have you stand up, and we can have some people surround you. They will come and believe God. You say, well, I want you to pray. Don't ever do that. It's, it's Jesus. Jesus is the one that heals. He's in us. Don't get your eyes on men. You get your eyes on Jesus. You follow me? Okay. I want to release faith over you guys. Father, I thank you for this weekend, this great time in this great house. Father, again, I bless the leadership, the intercessors, and the precious people that come to lock arms for your kingdom to come. I affirm and acknowledge again that there's something awesome happening here. And I thank you that it continues to grow and escalate. I thank you that this church will not be without wisdom. I thank you they'll not be without vision. 
I thank you, God. I, I see no quandary and no perplexed season in your future. I, I see you guys aware of what God's doing, aware of God, what, say, what He's saying. I actually don't see one season where you're perplexed. I see you calculated. I see you on target and going after God. I feel like a grace is coming over this church to cause you to know who you are and why you're here. And I see you staying focused. I don't even see the trials and the things that come causing you to question ever. I see you getting locked in, getting sure, about the will of God and seeing it fulfilled. And I just see you guys in a very well way running and laying down your life for the call of the kingdom of God. And uh, man, and, and you know, you're going to have these quandaries. Things are going to grow. You're not loving people so your church grows. You're loving people because God loves people. But actually your church is going to grow and things are going to happen and increase because love just does that. It was a little bit of that word that I shared last night and I was touching on it barely and I didn't feel like I was to go into too much detail. But that stuff's going to happen. It's going to grow and it's going to cross questions and quandaries. And I don't see you just stay in here in this place, you know. I, I see something having to change at some point. And don't be afraid of that. Don't let finances scare you. What God calls you to, God will supply. It's just true. And a lot of that had to do with that because there is going to be increase coming and stuff. And you're only facilitated for so much here and you'll do the best you can for a while. But at some point you're going to have to understand that there's some change coming. And it's not that you're trying to build a kingdom. It's because you're ministering a kingdom. The kingdom's already here. So don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of new buildings. Don't be afraid of finances. Don't be afraid of a bigger place. That just comes with it sometimes. But, but you want to know that it's not because you're focusing on building a kingdom. No, you're busy ministering a kingdom. And because you're ministering a kingdom, things are expanding. Amen? You just need to hear that as leaders. I'm just telling you, there's a season coming where you're not supposed to consider and be concerned so much in the natural. You're going to see God unfold this thing and make a way where there sometimes seems like no answer. And Father, I bless the people of this house. I bless the visitors. And I thank you that this region is lavished with righteousness and understanding. I thank you, God, that the tourists and the people that come here, come here and don't just encounter the smoky mountains and the recreation and let them do it. Let them have a blast, God. But as they come, let them encounter your love. I pray that tourists come and encounter your love, that they have just one encounter with one person that knows who they are and knows who the person is. God, I thank you that you sow seeds from this place. Father, I just see this as a place almost like a garden ground where you plant a lot of things. Father, let them come here and get sown into and go wherever they go, live wherever they live. But let it be known throughout time that they were sown into when they passed through this valley. That the Spirit of God marked them. That seeds went into them and brought eternal change. Father, I thank you that on the legacy and resume of this church for history, it will be said that men came here and didn't even know it. But what came here and happened here transformed the days of their lives. That lives were changed because they visited those smoky mountains. Because when they got there, they were loved. When they got there, they were prayed for. When they got there, they were healed. When they got there, they were interceded for. When they got that they were already bathed in prayer. And Father, I just thank you that you do something beyond what we can wrap our mind around. And God, never let us limit you with the lack of understanding. Never let us limit you with human reasoning. God, cause us to see bigger, see wider, see brighter, and not be afraid to do it. And not be called out of balance. And not to be called presumptuous. God, you said you can do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we ask, think, or imagine by the power working in us. Let us dream bigger. Let us see bigger. Let us think bigger. Because you said you can go farther. Let us see everybody saved. Let us see everybody overtaken and overrun. Let us see everybody got undone by the Spirit of the living God. Let us see people walking in peace, walking in love. Let us not be afraid to believe in this house. And Father, the people that don't understand and criticize and hype and all that stuff and say you're just exaggerating, let us not be moved by that. Let us not get a chip on our shoulder. Let us realize our war is never flesh and blood. We're not doing anything to project on people or to disprove anyone. We're doing things because of you, because of your will, and because of love. Father, I pray you protect this house with the purest of motive, the purest of heart, and let your kingdom come and cover this place just like the waters cover the sea. Father, we just thank you right now in Jesus' name for righteous revelation in this place. We thank you for a sin-free consciousness. And we thank you for revelation upon revelation. And God, I'm asking this one last thing. It's on my heart right now. That there would be such a manifestation of healing in this house. That God literally, and, I, and this is not hype. I, I do not hype things. I, I believe when I pray. 
that people would literally learn to come here to find hope and to be healed. That the stories would spread. I went there. They preached Jesus. I was so loved. They prayed for me. And it all went away. Why don't we go over there? And God, it's not even that they stay here. It's not even so they stay here. It's so they encounter you. It's so they see the finished work of Christ. And I just declare the revelation of healing in this house. And I pray that bodies be healed and lives be restored. I pray that what, what, what man says is impossible would take place right here in this room. And God, I thank you, God, that you would teach us the kingdom and that you would manifest it way beyond a church service, but that you would reveal that Jesus really is Lord. I pray that you saturate this region with testimony after testimony of the impossible. God, I thank you that you teach us not to fear things that have hurt us like cancer, leukemia. I, I pray, Lord God, that there be such a stronghold of God built here that cancer would bow, that these people would see it bow. That, that the cancer would fear the revelation in this house. And God, I thank you that you continue to build us up in that truth. And I bless you. I bless you, people. I bless you. In the Jesus' name, I bless you. If you hurt yourself through sin, if you, if you hurt yourself through sin, if sin has tried to mark your life and you're born again and you're forgiven and you're not the person you used to be, but you're still carrying the mark of sin in your body. Whether it be a hurt organ, memory loss, long term, short term. Just your digestive system got messed up because you drank too much. You got something in your blood that shouldn't be there because of something you did. I have good news for you. What the blood forgives, the blood of Jesus forgives, the body of Jesus removes. Yes. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. We don't just drink the cup of forgiveness. We eat the body of his flesh. The body of Christ paid for the penalty of sin to be removed from us. The blood was shed to forgive the act of sin. The body was given to remove the effects of that sin. If you're in your chair today and you're carrying the effects of a former mistake, a former life. And it's still in your body and now you're born again. I personally want to pray for you. And I want to command that thing to leave your body. Whether it's a hurt organ. Memory loss or something in your blood that shouldn't be there. And I don't want you to be ashamed because shame is a lie. We've all sinned. We've all missed the glory of God. We're not going to try to figure out what you did and what you have because I don't need to know what you have. I just need to know Jesus loves you. And I'm telling you, if you have something in your blood, it'll come out today. I'm believing that with all my heart. I've seen it too many times. If you've got short-term memory loss, if you've got trauma and nightmares and dreams and that past thing won't let you go, it'll let go today. I ain't playing. I'm telling you, I, I feel this thing. And Jesus is amazing. So if that's you, I want you to be humble. I want you to roll up here real quick. I'll be quick with it. I'm just going to lay hands on you and say, be redeemed in Jesus' name.